Shannon, I would love to start with the banner phrase on your website, believe in the power of stories to change the world, because that really impacted me. And first of all, I'd really love to know what that means to you. Yeah, I think, I think that the, I suppose the reason I've gotten into writing and storytelling in the first place is that it comes from a place of wanting to make a positive impact. Um, I think that that really is what stories kind of do. And I think that stories are, are supposed to be about sort of sharing the human experience, talking about things that we actually care about that matter. Um, and if, if they're not doing that, then they tend to sort of lack something. So I think the stories that I've always loved most have, have kind of made an impact on me, whether that's a personal impact that I've just really loved them, I've had a great time, or whether that's that I've learned something. And I think that that can take a lot of different forms, but I think it's a really nice thing to keep in mind when you are writing, acting, dancing, whatever, creating art in some way. Yeah, that's lovely, that way of looking at it, that storytelling can make an impact. And I know from your Instagram account that you're a really avid reader, I tell you what this makes me think of, Shannon, is for me, when I first started telling stories, and this was like age 10 when I first started writing, I was reading Aesop's Fables, and I really loved the morals and the messages that we got from those stories, and that really had an impact on me. So I then wanted to craft stories that helped other people learn the same morals and the same messages. So I suppose a follow-up question would be if you if you feel there's some kind of recurring message or recurring moral, that might sound a bit too pious, but you know, maybe just some recurring themes that you think, oh, when people read my work, I'd really love them to learn this or take this away from them. What what might be some of those recurring themes or messages? I think that's really interesting. I was actually thinking about this the other day. Um, because I think I suppose because I also come from a background with environmental science, that's very much nature and, and sort of environmental stewardship is very much at the heart of, of a lot of the stories that I'm working on and want to be working on. Um, but I was also just thinking, I think that the world can be a really difficult place, especially lately, especially these this, in the current time that we're living in. Um, and I think being able to just sort of express kindness and it's something that's a bit gentle i think if i was thinking what would i like somebody to be able to immediately associate with me is i'm thinking well something that is going to be ultimately a message of positivity or of hope and i think that that's really important yeah that message of hope is definitely something that i get from your content and it's interesting because there's this strange walk that I find the more we become aware of the environment. So, you, so for you know, you as an environmental scientist, you've got a lot more knowledge around what's happening to the environment. And it's kind of a double edged sword because you see a lot of what possibly people aren't aware of, or maybe they're, they're willfully ignoring. And yet, you still maintain that hope. So I was really curious as to how you maintain that hope alongside that awareness of knowing that we are in a crisis at the moment. I think it can be a really difficult thing. Um, I think we know that we're in a crisis in terms of the environment. We know that, that climate is going to be an issue that we face and that the next generation are really going to deal with. And I don't think that hope means necessarily burying your head in the sand or not recognizing that but I think it's it's sort of looking at the people who are make, making steps and and making changes and looking for opportunities to do what the environment needs um, and to help others in that as well I think there was I can't remember who it was by now but there was a, a wonderful quote that said something about look for helpers and I always remember that I think that's a a really in a, in a time of, of great challenge um, and as we face more sort of climate related disasters, it's really powerful to see that there are people who are really fighting for, for the good. Mm. And that so makes me think of a lot of the practices that I've learned through my life coaching training and my NLP training, which is 
being really aware of the way you are looking at things and seeking to see if you can find a different way of looking at things. So like you say, hope isn't about burying our head in the sand. It's about redirecting that gaze to the opportunities or to the helpers. I'm curious, do you have a place where that negative lens creeps in in a way that you do redirect it? Because I see myself as someone who's hopeful and optimistic, but that doesn't mean that I have my dark places that my psyche will just naturally slip into. And then for me, it's about catching myself when I'm in that place and then redirecting it. So I'm curious as to what your flavor is, like where your negativity creeps in, how you spot that and how you redirect it. I think, yeah, I think it's it's very much a work in progress. I think, um, to be completely honest, I don't know that being um, a glass half full sort of perspective always comes super naturally to me. Um, mm. I think it's something that I've had to cultivate and had to sort of really work on and continue to try and cultivate in other areas of my life. I think I sort of trained myself, I guess, how to do it in this this perspective. But I'm still looking at ways to sort of bring that across into other areas. And I think that that probably is the case for a lot of people, particularly the world we live in, is looking at it's an ever-evolving thing. And as you face new challenges, you sort of have to work out how to respond to that particular challenge in its own unique sort of elements. Yeah, I love the way that you mention it can be happening in one area, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're able to flip from the half empty to the half full in all of the other areas. We call that transplanting. So like if I'm working with a client who's got a good habit in one area, we're like, well, how can we transplant that into a different environment? So I love that you're just instinctively doing that. Yeah, and I think also, thank you for reflecting on the fact that it doesn't come naturally and yet that doesn't mean it's impossible. Because I think there's something about the way that we've evolved. Having that glass half empty outlook has helped us survive as a species. Like if you if you're sort of looking at it through an evolutionary lens, how would you describe how perhaps we've evolved as a species by imagining the worst? And yet we're almost at a point in our evolution where in order to move forward in a way that we're in right relationship with the earth, we actually need to flip that switch and start imagining the best or imagining how to turn the impossible into possible. It's Yeah, it's a really difficult sort of kind of transient time that we're living in. I think it, we're in quite sort of a bit of a crossroads at the moment, um, sort of from a global perspective. I mean... From an evolutionary perspective, I'm sure that it was quite helpful to be at least a little bit negative if, you know, a tiger's coming into your cave. You need to have you have, have that instinct to be able to go, this is probably a threat. Um, but I think in the world we live in today, we have so many, you know, innovations, whether that's medical, whether that's technology, and yet we also have this crisis. And really, unless you have some hope for it, you're not going to have any motivation to actually mm. fight. You know, I think if you thought that it was all over now, you'd think, well, what's what's where is the hope? What's the point in continuing to try? Whereas if you do have some hope, you go, well, there is something worth fighting for here. And so I, it's worth me taking those steps. Yeah, that's... I mean, that's really spot on, this idea that we have to have the belief that there is something there that we can fight for. I do witness other people and sometimes I will find myself in that state where I, where I can see the way that I'm living is as if it's all, it's all going to come to an end. And that's one of the places I have to catch myself. Do, have you heard of Zach Bush? I have, yeah. Yeah, I thought you might have. So there was something that he said that really, really helped me because he's got a medical background. He was talking about spontaneous remission in cancer patients. And he was saying, you know, that's a miracle, but the medical community have a technical term for it because they don't really know how to handle such things as miracles. But he also described how such a miracle can happen with the earth as well, that the earth itself can go into spontaneous remission and heal just like that. And for me, that is what I always go back to whenever I find myself in a place of like, God, haven't we gone too far? You know, there's so many species that we're losing. What are we going to do? I, you know, I just see Zach Bush in my mind and I just see his face talking about spontaneous remission. And I think 
If this guy who trained as a medical doctor is talking with a completely straight face like a miracle is possible, I'm going to choose to believe that. So yeah, I'm curious as to what you think of that principle that there is the possibility that a spontaneous remission could happen. I mean, hopefully. I think I think it would be kind of remiss to think that none of these things are possible. I think there's so much scope for in this current world, we've learned so much. We've learned so much about the environment and about the human body or about whatever else. But that doesn't mean that there's not so much more left to learn. And the reality of it is that we understand maybe half of it, if that. You know, I think even in terms of species, the the, the general consensus at the moment in the scientific community is that we know about 10% or something of the amount of species that are out there. And there's this whole wealth of other biodiversity that we just know nothing about. And so what's to say that the fix isn't something that we just haven't as a human species uncovered yet? I love that. Yeah, I really love that. And also getting that perspective of like, we know such a small amount of all that available knowledge, like that available knowledge is really infinite. And so, yeah, that that fix or that solution could be just outside of our current yeah. perspective. I love that. Sharon, I'd love to start talking about your writing because I know that you've got a very intriguing book that's um, that's that's out for query at the moment, A Song for the Earth. And <laughs> I'm so intrigued by this book. Obviously, I'd love to hear you describe it, but it's a climate focused novel. It's a novel and it's written in verse. And so my initial in reaction when I saw that was a sense of someone who was choosing to write the very thing that they absolutely want to write. You're not trying to fit into a mold to please anybody. You're literally saying, this is the book that I am here to write. Because I don't think, well, I haven't really seen many other examples of a climate focused novel in verse. So tell us a little bit more about it. And, you know, tell us about the, the impetus that came behind wanting to write this book. Yeah, it sort of was a bit of a process, I guess. Um, it sort of, it took a lot of sort of incarnations, I guess, and none of them felt quite right. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. when you're doing something, whether that's painting or, you know, filmmaking, you just sort of have a sense of, oh, I've got an idea, it's not quite hitting the mark. And it sort of stewed there for a while until I worked out what was wrong. Um, and it was really, I was always sort of narrowing my focus and I thought that I, I care so much about all of these other places and the world feels like such a broad sweeping idea and I kept sort of simplifying it down to a single place or a single time or a single location and then I sort of thought you know what I'm just gonna it's it's an, a unique form it's a unique approach it's probably not the most marketable thing in the world so I'm just going to sort of go with what my instinct tells me to do with it um, and I'm going to write it from a perspective that brings in all of these other places that I'm so interested in and that have so many interesting and and fascinating settings to deal with um, and that are dealing with such challenges. And so the story ends up basically following a main character on a journey through the world and through the world, Earth's major biomes. And she sort of travels around and gets a sense of what these places have to offer, what makes these places so beautiful and so amazing, um, and the people who live there, but also a sense of what these places are actually facing as we deal with ongoing climate change. I love the sound of this, Shannon, and I wanna pick up on two things that you've said. The first is that feeling that as the novel evolved, there were these like, mm, that's not quite right because I think that's really common in the writing process. We've got the idea, but the idea often or sometimes doesn't show up with like an operating instruction or a, or a user's guide. So we have to sort of try to interpret this idea and then, and then manifest it because the idea is just coming, you know, up here, it's like in our third eye, it's in our thoughts. And so how do we turn that into words? So can we zoom in a little bit when you said that you sort of had this sense that it wasn't quite right? How did that play out and how did you navigate that place? Because 
as we know, the brain hates uncertainty. So it hates to be in a place where it's got a feeling that something isn't right, but it doesn't have the solution. So how did you navigate that? I think um, with this one, I really, I think I had sort of a couple of false starts and I kept sort of starting to write it and I kept thinking it's not, it's not really hitting the mark. Um, and so it was sort of taking a bit of time away from that and going, why isn't it hitting the mark? And I think just going back to sort of, I mean, I love a good Pinterest board. I love sort of a, a good um, getting a sense of what something sort of looks like um, and sort of recognizing what it was about it that I thought that it, I would want in it. What was I going to actually enjoy writing? Um, and I think that that shows. I think I wrote it quite quickly. Um, I wrote it as something that I actually had a fun, I had a lot of fun writing it. And I think that shows in projects. I think when you read a book that somebody has actually loved the experience of putting pen to paper, that that shines through in the work as opposed to something that they've just hated the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also what kept you at it because I know of writers out there and I've done this myself where I've had a false start and then I've given up because I thought oh maybe this isn't a good idea or maybe this is beyond me so what kept you at it I actually don't know I think I think this one because I've definitely had that experience with other things and I've had it since as well um it's not sort of there's just something with this one that I went, you know what, I think maybe because it was a little bit different um, and it was a little bit left of field and I was then sort of guiding my own experience, I suppose, rather than kind of relying on some sort of template of this is what a book like this should look like. There weren't really clear comp titles for that book. And so I was able to just kind of run with what I wanted to do. And I think that that gives you a lot of freedom, which can be intimidating but it can also be a lot of fun that's so interesting that example that you were guiding your own experience because to me I think that's when we hit the sweet spot when we do get in a place where we can sense that guide like it's coming from within it's intuitive and I I know I said earlier that the idea arrives and it doesn't come with operating instructions I think the next closest thing to those operating instructions is letting your intuition guide you so how did you like how did you experience that guide did it come in the realm of feeling did it come I mean you said that you used Pinterest so were you just seeing things and then finding images like how did you get a sense of the way that you were being guided I think a lot of it for me also came from study I think the more that I I, I do find that the more that I sort of study something and learn more I realized just how much I had no idea about and I'm I, I'm almost overwhelmed by all the things I want to include and I think that was kind of the underpinning of this one was that in this project, I got to include all of those interesting facts that I thought made such a difference and were so important to articulate, and I got to include them all. And I think being able to be led by that and go, okay, well, where do I want to go? I'm a little bit lost. Well, what's the actual information? And like, mm -hmm. realistically, I was writing about the real world that we live in. So there's no shortage of inspiration. There's no shortage of information. You just go and you find that information and then you kind of come back to the art and work out how to integrate it, if that makes sense. Oh, that makes so much sense. I love that idea of the collaboration between the two. You've got the idea of, okay, I can actually find specific knowledge because I know the, the essence of the book, which is to talk about all as many different biomes and environments as possible. But then I'm kind of adding my own imaginative impulses to that as well. Yeah. It, it, and again, it sort of speaks to a lot of the blocks that writers can face is where they where they run out of ideas. And it's like they haven't got a strategy of what to do to, to almost fill up the idea bank. So it sounds like whenever you might have hit a gap or a pause, it was a case of, well, let me just go back to my knowledge. Let me just go back to my studying and see what's there. Yeah, I think there's sort of I mean, I, I suppose there's the beauty of it is that you've never finished learning, have you? So there's so much out there um, and there's always going to be someone who knows it so much better than you do and that that can be a threat but it doesn't have to be I think that that really is just an opportunity to go well what can I 
can I learn from this person and from these other sources and how can I sort of bring that into an opportunity for other people to learn it from me and then it becomes this sort of knowledge base that everybody's sharing ideas and I think that's really important. So important and actually that makes me think about a struggle that I had and this was probably in my 30s now where I had this belief that I should know everything and I actually felt to put myself in the position of I'm learning was a, was a place of vulnerability that I was terrified to go. And that really kept me stuck. And it wasn't until I embraced the, you know, the archetype of the learner and I, and I essentially rewired my brain to welcome knowing nothing, which wasn't easy, that I really started to see myself taking huge steps forward. So I'm curious, have you always invited the, the archetype of the learner or did you have, have a, did you have a, did you have a place where you had to sort of let go? Okay, I don't know everything. I am going to have to embrace this, this vulnerable moment where I'm admitting that, that my knowledge is like insignificant compared to all of the knowledge out there. I think it, it can be a really difficult thing. I think, I think, again, it really depends on sort of what area of your life you're dealing with. I think that there are definitely areas of your life where you might feel like you're supposed to have it all together and you're supposed to just know this. And there are other areas where I would automatically assume like, no, this is always going to take work for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's sort of being able to maybe take elements out of the areas of your life where you know that you're going to have to work at it and learning how to apply those in the areas where you sort of have this unrealistic expectation on yourself that you've got to be an expert the minute that you walk in. Yeah, again, we're doing a bit of transplanting. That's great. So Shannon, the other thing that you mentioned with regards to your book was something like the phrase of it wasn't going to be the most marketable. And that made me think of something else that I shared in another conversation on this platform where I, I sort of had this aha moment where I realized, oh, I can hear your dog coming back from its walk. <laughs> I can hear his, his nails on the, on the floor. Um, it made me think of the fact that storytelling is something that has been with us from you know, throughout the way that we've evolved as a species. Oh, there, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> they Sorry. want to join in the interview. <laughs> She's got to be involved. <laughs> um, so storytelling is something that we, that we had as a species. We were storytellers because we might want to tell a story about the fact that we were able to find food in a certain area and we want to express that to the rest of our tribe. We were gathering around the campfire, we were telling stories. And then at some point, the publishing industry was born. I know I've kind of literally talked about evolution in about two steps. It was obviously more complicated than that. And then when the publishing industry was born, suddenly stories had a gatekeeper. So we've got this almost like this evolutionary mismatch where we have an impulse to tell the story, to sing our own unique song. But then we've got people that say, that's not a song I want to hear or that song isn't going to get you published. And so we then start to manufacture or change the song that is unique to us. And I think that is a huge tragedy. So I think that was the other thing when I saw your the book that you're querying, a song a song for the earth. I saw that it was a climate focused novel. I saw that it was written in verse. I thought to myself, here's someone who's singing the song that's unique to her. Um, so it, what? Yeah, what do you think about that? This idea of the impact that the publishing world might have had on the voice that wants to speak through us. I think yeah, I think it's really difficult. I think. At the end of the day, we know that publishing is a business and that underpins a lot of the decisions that go into it. Um, and it means that, unfortunately, it doesn't always mean that, that the best book or the most unique book gets picked up because things do get picked up based on whether there are comparative titles. Um, is there a track record for something like this having sold well before? 
what are the sales numbers likely to be? Does this person have a lot of Instagram followers and is that going to make it easier to sell the book? Um, and I think for a lot of writers that I speak to, even I also have work as an editor, and I think it's something that, that freaks a lot of them out. It's, it can be a really scary thing um, to sort of go, well, how do I write to this market? And yeah. the you really can't because the market is constantly changing. Um, and I think while you do need to remember that it is a business and those business decisions and those business skills are going to be important, that can't be the the undercurrent of every every piece of art that you produce because if that's the undercurrent of every piece of art you produce then realistically you're never going to see anything new or innovative everything's kind of going to be what has worked before and i think we'd miss out on a lot of really amazing projects yeah that's that's a I love that way of looking at it where it's a case of we're either just going to be reproducing or reenacting everything that's come before or we can put ourselves in a position where we can where we can create new things and I suppose the irony is is that often when we introduce something new into the mix initial reaction can be a little bit like ooh this is different you know I'm not sure if I want this so I think it then comes back to, are you gonna are you gonna stand by it? So I'd love to hear, you know, how how do you feel in terms of the journey that you're having as you query this book and your belief in the book and your determination to stand by it? It's definitely been an interesting experience, I think, because it's it's I suppose given me the opportunity to revisit I guess what my what what did drive me to write it um and what does drive the next project that I want to work on or any other decisions that I'm making um because I have had some feedback from from people who have been kind enough to offer it um and that has quite often been I don't know what the market for this is um I don't know what the comparative titles are I'm just not confident taking on a project that is written in verse um I'm a little bit wary about how to market something that is focused on climate when publishing is a business that has connections to things that might be slightly at odds with that message. Um, mm. And I think that that has been interesting because if anything, that sort of, I suppose, has, has made my conviction stronger in it um, because I, I feel like, no, you know what, this is a story that I told because I wanted to tell it and I still believe in it. Um, and it's still something that I'm proud of having written. And at some point you kind of have to step back and go, okay, you want to sell something, you want to sell a book, you want to be able to share this message, but why did you write this? Did you write it because you wanted it to be a product or did you write it for the art of it? And sometimes the answer is somewhere in the middle, but mm. I think if ultimately you did care about the art, I think that that makes the rejections a lot easier to handle. Yes, and actually what that's making me think of is the difference between caring about the art and really standing by it versus the project is something that you just want because it's going to give you external validation. And the reason I say that is because I've absolutely been in that camp where I've had rejections for something that just triggered an old wound of rejection that I was trying to overcome by finally getting accepted. And yes, I what you said really resonates with me, where you really just align yourself with the art of the project. I'm curious, as an environmental scientist, can you think of how this whole analogy could be applied to how a species is evolving? It could be some kind of animal species, it could be some kind of plant species where it's been necessary to have that outlier or that totally new art form. And how, like the publishers were saying, you know, we, we don't have a track record of this, but actually that's not a reason to say no to the way something is evolving. Yeah, absolutely. I think progress doesn't happen um, by a bunch of people playing by all the rules, I think that, <laughs> Um, you sort of need somebody to kind of step outside of the out of, outside of the box a little bit. Um, and I mean, really, most of the big hits that we've had, whether that's you know a song or a book or a movie, 
they've been because they've offered something a little bit different um, and the market didn't know that it wanted that and then the market responded and went oh that's great we really like that and we want more of that and then it creates a trend but somebody had to set that trend to begin with and I think we absolutely see that in the environment as well I think we see that in just life in general I think that that's how life evolves is you know if, if everything stays the same then we'd still be right at the very beginning of, of an, an oxygenic world where there really wasn't anything happening um yeah i think in order for life will out it sort of there needs to be that level of of change and evolution and that only happens if if a couple of people are or species or, or what have you are uncomfortable and are willing to mm. sort of be be the difference and be that first step in that change mm. Yeah, so you so you're being that first step in the change, which and that you know that is the feeling I got when I when I saw the work that you were putting out there when we had a little brief conversation, because I'm drawn to people who are being that next step because that's very much where I see myself as well, and when I saw that the novel was written in verse, it's making me think of the writer Bernadine Evaristo. She's a she's a UK writer. Have you heard of her? I have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I suppose you have because I think she won the Booker Prize, I think, didn't she, for her, her novel in verse? I think so, yeah, yeah. So, again, it's such, I suppose, and, and what's coming to mind, and I posted on this on Instagram just this week, I'm surrounded by wheat fields at the moment. And if you look across any of the wheat fields, you see a few patches where the ears have grown a lot more than the rest of the field. And so it isn't just one, there's there's various patches around and slowly all of the wheat is gonna catch up. So I suppose it's rare that we are the only one who's taking that step forward and how beautiful it is when we can sort of come up above the rest and see, you know, see the heads of other people who are also doing, you know, something a little bit similar that, that gives us the confidence. I love that, yeah. <laughs> So Shannon, let's let's have a little bit more of an exploration around nature because obviously your novel that you're querying is about is about climate, it's about nature, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal connection to nature. Obviously you're an environmental scientist, but but really that sort of, you know, you you as a person, you as a human, you as a soul. What's that what's what's the personal connection that you have to nature? And how has that evolved over time? I think that that's become a lot stronger as I've gotten older, I think. Um, and I think that a lot of that has probably come from just the challenges that you experience as you, as you grow up and as you, as you hit different stages of your life. I think there is sort of almost particularly, I think maybe in a post-COVID world as well, looking for that sort of level of simplicity. And I think while nature isn't necessarily a, a simplistic structure um there is that sort of more i suppose holistic point of view um more natural and i think i think that that sort of it, it looks beyond sort of the the, the steely gray buildings and the the sort of kind of blank walls of, of an institutional building it's sort of looking at where um, where, where do you fit as, as a person, as, as a species, um, and how has sort of the, the world has evolved to this place? And I think that, that you can find a lot of peace in that um, and a lot, of, a lot of even looking at symbols for hope. I think that you find a lot of those do actually come from nature. Um, and I think that that sort of gets you thinking about, okay, well, what really is the underpinning of the world that I live in? And it's the world itself, you know, um, more than sort of I think that any any other field that I could have possibly got it got it gotten into would have really been underpinned still by the environment that it all happens within what you said about the fitting and and the role that nature plays and that ability to sense how we fit versus when we're staring at a blank wall or that or that gray of urbanization what it makes me reflect on Shannon is and actually I suppose I'm still thinking of the publishing industry a little bit experiences I've had 
where I've been in a system of some kind, but not a nature-based system. And I have very much felt like I didn't fit. But whenever I'm out in nature, that feeling of being a round peg in a square hole, it just dissolves and I'm in my place again. And if we go back to this idea of transplanting, my healing journey has very much been about healing the wound of not fitting in society by transplanting the experience of fitting in nature into a building or into a job or into the more industrial environment. I can see that you're nodding. Does this resonate with you? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm curious. So we've got your lovely evolution of nature as giving you a sense of, of fitting, you know, giving you a sense of the world that's underpinning everything. How would you say that has woven itself into your writing and your process of creativity? I think definitely, particularly in the recent years, um, it tends to be thematically something that I look at a lot. Um, and I think part of that comes with the fact that I write primarily about hope and light and joy and those sorts of things. Um, not obviously without, with absence of, of conflict, but I think that does tend to kind of mirror um, a natural environment. And I think that, I think that really stories kind of tend to evolve in a lot of the same ways that the environment does. And I think that they are actually more closely linked than people would maybe automatically expect them to be. And so I, I think that it's not necessarily a difficult connection or marriage to make. I think that they are quite linked inherently. Mm. And what's your experience when you're writing about hope and, and light? Like as you're in the process, do you find that focusing on that theme or crafting a journey that might come from darkness to light or fear to hope does that have an impact on you as you're writing i think so yeah i think i mean i think that would be the case even in in a book that i was reading i've i've definitely had that experience where i've i've sort of experimented with with literature that i'm taking in or movies that i'm taking in um and you sort of you do notice that it has an impact on your mood or where you're at or or you sort of the, the, the lens that you look at the world through. Um, and I definitely have had that even just as a reader. So I think that that's kind of magnified um, when you're producing something. If you're sort of sitting in that feeling or that perspective a lot, it does tend to frame the way that you're looking at everything else as well. And so if you're looking through a positive point of view or an ultimately hopeful story, that's going to bring that lens to the other things that you're looking at in your life far more than if you're reading something that's just really, really upsetting, that tends to be the way that you look at things as well. And that's pretty significant because I wholeheartedly agree with that. And if we find that our tastes draw more to gloomy aspects, violent lenses, that is going to impact the lens that we view the world through. I had an interesting conversation with Stephen Moss, who's who's coming on, on the podcast, and he was talking about the fact that his audience are people who have an interest in nature and, and want to learn more. But we were also recognising that actually the people that are most in need of his work are the people who've lost the connection or, or in the context of what we're talking about now, don't have that hopeful lens or that inspiring lens. What do you think about that in terms of the audience to which you write and how you might try to reach the people who are probably really in need of what you write but don't realise it? I think that's a really difficult thing to do. I think, you know, it, it's it's one thing to target people who are already open to what you've got to say. It's another thing to talk to a room where people don't necessarily want to listen. Um, and I think that, I suppose, is one of the things that I would like to explore more um, in terms of marrying being a writer and being an environmental scientist, because I think you can make the climate science a lot more accessible 
to the general population. And I think if you if you tell some some stories that are just entertaining stories, but ultimately have that undercurrent and that that theme, um, I think that that quite possibly has even more impact than telling a story to a, a market that was very much always going to be interested and always going to be sort of nodding along and agreeing with what you had to say. Um, it's sort of another thing to be able to open somebody else's eyes to your way of thinking um, and to sort of connecting with the environment and looking at what, what steps they could be taking in their own life or who, perhaps who they're supporting um, mm. or, or what decisions they're making and how that is affecting themselves and the world around them. Yeah, that's so interesting, Shannon. And it makes me reflect on actually a contrast of two tweets that I saw this week, both of them from people who are hugely involved in nature, hugely involved in writing about nature. One of them was an observation where they were just tweeting about the fact that they were listening to a cuckoo that morning and really savouring the experience because it might be the, the last season that the cuckoo is singing. And I felt so moved by that. I mean, it's actually making tears come to my eyes, just sharing it back. So that tweet really impacted me. And actually, when I was out walking this morning, there's a cuckoo on my walk. I also took a moment to savour it and to really think, oh my gosh, what if, what if this was the last summer I heard a cuckoo singing? The other tweet was quite aggressive and angry and it was railing against a certain attitude that farmers had at the moment. And that tweet made me want to unfollow that person. So I'm curious, you know, what, what do you have to say about the people who really care about the environment, but they can't talk about it without a huge amount of anger? And I don't think I'm the only person that's going to be put off by that versus the other person who can talk more about an intimate, sensual experience and then and therefore inspire someone through that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it can be a really difficult thing to do, but I, th I think that you've got to sort of remember, and it doesn't matter what, what you're talking about, whether that's the environment or whether that's something completely different. Nobody likes to be sort of proven wrong or yelled at or um, have it sort of feel like a, an attack or an assault on their, their existing sort of the underpinnings of, the, of their thought mechanisms and the way that they their values and, and their ideas. Nobody wants to feel like they're suddenly being proven wrong. And I think that there is a lot more to gain out of kind of instead of necessarily just giving a lecture, opening the lines of communication. And I think that that mm. happens when you take a more gentle approach that invites people to go, okay, well, what would you like to say? Or do you have any questions? Or would you follow this up with, you know, whether that is a debate, whether that is, is just learning more, it has to be a, a two-way conversation because if people don't feel like they're welcome to be part of it, then they sort of tend to just kind of go, well, I'm not, I'm not interested at all then. Yeah, that two-way conversation, that definitely strikes a chord with me. And interesting, it also makes me think of how I've recently overcome a reluctance to engage with certain types of nature writing because I didn't think I knew enough and because I thought that the book was, would make me feel overwhelmed and really point out how little I knew. And it's because I've got that awareness, as I said earlier, that I sometimes feel challenged when I, when I put my learner hat back on, I was able to overcome that. But yes, this idea of the two-way conversation and almost really enabling the person to learn through that exchange seems so vital in this time. Absolutely, I think. Shannon, I'd love to also now start to talk a little bit about diversity because I've learned a huge amount in terms of how important it is that we maintain diversity in our natural world, in the environment, maintain diversity of species. I also know that it's very important to maintain diversity in terms of the food that we eat. We've got to eat lots of diverse foods so that we're enabling our gut microbiome all the all the bacteria in our in our gut to be happy and healthy 
But one thing that you've reminded me of is the importance of having diversity in the characters that we're writing about. I think there was a recent post on Instagram where you really talked about that. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what makes you so passionate about the, you know, enabling readers, all all readers to see themselves in in the books that they're reading. I think that there's a lot of lot of elements to it. I think, um, I mean, on on the one hand, it's just a case of it's it's nice to think that you're included, um, and it's nice to be a part of things. And not everybody gets that, and it is a privilege um, to to see yourself to turn on the television and see a character who looks like you, or to pick up a book and see a journey that sort of feels like yours, um, or to see, particularly, I think in fantasy books is is a big one. Um, people with disabilities don't often see a world that is necessarily inclusive of, of them and yet the real world has this diversity in them so in order to be a realistic presentation it does need to have these underpinnings um i think as well when you do go through something whether you are somebody dealing with discrimination whether you are um, dealing with a disability i think a lot of people do turn to to media um, to sort of look for people who have had that that similar experience, whether that person is actually a real person or whether they're a story character. Um, and I know that that was very much a case for me. Um, when I had an amputation, I went looking for books that would, ha- that would have a main character who had been through something similar, and I didn't actually find many. Um, so I think that it, it's important to sort of reflect the world we live in and to reflect that there is there is beauty in that, but also just to bring people in and, and know that... that it's it's got to be a, a sense of everybody is a part of this and everybody is welcome um, because it can be very easy without even meaning to to exclude a particular group and it it might not be intentional but the impact is the same yeah that's super powerful it's it's lovely how you point out that books or media is almost that first step that people go to to either find examples of themselves or advice on how to navigate their journey and you know your own experience where you weren't able to find that many examples it also makes me think of how damaging it can be if the only examples you find are very caricature caricature and just don't relate to you at all. Did you have experience of that or have you noticed that? Definitely, and I think as well, obviously I speak from a perspective of of disability representation because that's what I have experience with. Um, But a lot of the time they they, they tend to be used as um, sort of elements that are used to characterise a villain. And I just think that can be so damaging. Um, There was a a case a few years ago actually of, it was a major Hollywood production with really big stars in it. Um, and they cast an entire group of villains who all, as their, their sort of key characteristic that set them apart, was they all had limb differences. They all had um, electrodactyly of the hands. And it was really distressing for a lot of people. I think people don't want to see um, a difference that they have and see that that's associated with the person we're not supposed to like here. People want to see themselves in the hero. Oh my gosh, I can literally feel the emotion rippling through me as you tell me this. The the fact that what could someone's experience be if the only representation they see of themselves is as the villain? What kind of messaging is that sending? So yes, the, it, you know, equally destructive, not seeing themselves represented at all or possibly even more disruptive, seeing themselves only represented as the villain, sort of saying, you know, this is your this is your place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one thing even to see that as at a certain point of your life where you're um, a bit older and have the skills to sort of have a bit of media literacy and, and be able to dissect that. But I, I can only imagine um, seeing that and having and identifying with that at say six years old um, or as it throughout your childhood, I think that that would really <clears throat> colour a lot of your identity and your perception of, of yourself and others like you. Yes, exactly. If they're younger and it's going to essentially give them a sense of, you know, this is your lens and that's going to colour your way forward. 
One of the other things I noticed on your Instagram account, and it's the first time, Shannon, I've seen this, and I can't, you know, I'm, I'm quite minimal on Instagram, but I've certainly looked at a lot of posts in my time where you have a description for people who are either visually impaired or unable to see the post entirely. What do you think about the fact that that's the first time I've seen it? it could, I suppose it could reflect the kinds of people I'm following, but when did you start doing that and tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah, I think that um, I've sort of learned a lot from other people um, and just conversations, and that was definitely something that, that other people have sort of um, taught me how to do. I don't think I'm amazing at it, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think that my descriptions are always... Um, my description writing skills for that is always where I would like them to be. Um, but I think it's really important. I think it's such a, a simple way of just making sure that everyone gets to be involved and included. And it's really no different than adding captions to a video um, so that somebody who is either hard of hearing or who is watching it on mute is able to take that in. Um, and it can only be beneficial to your content as well because it just means that more people can access it in different ways. Yeah, you know what? I actually found myself reading the descriptions and it adding another layer to my experience because I suppose, and this comes back to the lens, if we're looking at a photograph, what's the lens that we're looking through? A lot of the time, if we're on Instagram, that lens can be the lens of comparison. So we can be looking at a photograph and thinking, look at her hair, look at where she is, that's, that's where I want to be. I want to be in a beautiful villa with a, with a beautiful ocean as the background. But when I read the visual description, it sort of said, this, this is a picture with all of these components. It sort of took away any psychological slant that I might be bringing to the image. So I actually found it quite impactful for me. Amazing. <laughs> Shannon, just to just to round up our conversation, which I feel like we've gone in so many beautiful, fruitful directions, like we've really we've really kind of covered it all. But um, I'd like to just finally touch on some of the challenges that you face when writing about nature, because it might be that there's people who have been watching this who have a relationship with nature have an impulse to write but don't really know how to overcome some challenges that they're experiencing or that they've been trying to write about nature but they've hit up against some walls so i'd love for you to share perhaps a main challenge or a recent challenge that you've come across when you're trying to write about nature and how you might have overcome that i think one of the big things with with it is that it can when you're writing about sort of the environment it can be quite daunting and quite overwhelming um it's such a sweeping sweeping idea and a sweeping concept and I think that that can feel like a little bit much for a lot of people um and I think that being able to kind of break things down um and look at them more sort of at, at piece by piece I think that that can really help um and I think that just being being recentered by what it is that you're trying to do why you're doing it um if you have decided that you want to write about about nature and the environment there is probably a reason and I think that that can be a very good sort of grounding point um, that allows you to sort of do away with some of the noise and do away with some of the, the things that might be distractions and sort of come back, recenter to, to why it is that I'm here, what it is that I want to achieve, and there, then for how I want to do that and what, what steps I need to be taking within myself to do that. Mm, super helpful. Certainly the breaking it down. I don't write about the environment, but it might be that I've been in nature and, I'd ha and I've had an experience and I come home and I'm sort of like, where do I start? And the way that I notice my brain working is a sense that it, it all has to happen at once. The, the tricky thing about writing is that you have to write one word after another after another, and you have to be very patient because only once you've written about I don't know, 50 sentences, do you get the whole experience? But my mind is wanting the whole experience literally in that first word. So I love the idea of, of breaking it down, whether it's you're writing about some aspect of the environment or some aspect of your experience. And then, yeah, really coming back to what that, what that impulse or that desire is, why are you doing it? 
And I'm also curious, have you ever had an experience where you, the writing about it has really switched on a light bulb for you that almost in turning an idea or a feeling or an experience or a piece of knowledge into a piece of writing it's given you an even greater understanding or like a like a major aha moment yeah definitely I think I think particularly if you tend have a tendency to think through through a writing or a reading lens which is definitely me I think that that writing about something can make it um maybe even a little bit more real I think that it can can make it a little bit easier to connect with with places or ideas that are quite far from your own reality and I think that particularly living um, in Australia it's a long way away from a lot of the places that I'm going to be talking about I think that that can be a really positive thing Um, being able to sort of put pen to paper and have that be part of the process of of feeling a little bit more confident I guess in what I have to say about it Ooh, I really like that, that that putting the pen to paper, bringing more confidence in. I can I can relate to that and also that it makes the experience more real. I wonder if that's because you're really, you know, you've really got to be present with the experience when you're writing about it. So sometimes I find that I might have been in nature and possibly a bit distracted. And then I come home and I've really got to sit with the experience and I go through it again and I almost then validate the experience by giving it words and putting those words on the page. Absolutely. Shannon, thank you so much for talking to me today. I've really enjoyed hearing your wisdom, like getting to know a bit about the world from your perspective. Just as we've been talking and all of the things that we've reflected on, I'd love to just give you a moment. It might be that I didn't ask you something you were really hoping that I would ask you, or it might be that as we've been connecting today and talking, something's dropped in that you just want to reflect and share. So this is just a final moment for you to add anything that you feel called to. Um, Yeah, I think just... um... I mean, thank you for having me. I think it's a really positive thing to have these sorts of conversations um, and to to bring different perspectives and from such different parts of the world as well. I think particularly in, in something like nature writing, I think we bring such different experiences from different backgrounds, but also just different places. I think that it's it's such a valuable thing to have the opportunity to, to share those ideas in, in a space like this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that too. Shannon, thank you. Thank you.